Okay, great. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, as Keith said, my name is Jason Anderson. I'm a teacher trainer and a writer. Um, I've lived extensively in, uh, as you said, Keith, in Eritrea and also in Rwanda, where I was for a year and a half. Um, in my free time, I'm also a bird watcher, just a, just a fanatical bird watcher, do a little bit of amateur ornithology as well. Um, the talk I'm going to give you today is going to cover all these different areas of uh, Rwanda and bird watching in Rwanda. The background, the country, a little bit more about the history and the future, the biogeography of Rwanda, the four different habitat types, which are Albertine Rift Highland Forest, three locations I'll mention, savannah and woodland, there's a big park called Akagera or Akagera as it's pronounced in the east, papyrus swamps, which Rwanda has many of, agricultural land, which is very productive for birding, uh, and then a little bit about logistics, transport, accommodation, and guides for anyone interested in visiting Rwanda. Also a little bit more about when to visit, uh, a few books which I'd recommend, and then there may be time for questions at the end, depending on how we get on. So first of all, a little bit about, about the background uh, of the country, um, Rwanda. Um, here's a map of Rwanda. It's, as Keith said, the most densely populated country in Africa. Um, it's monolinguistic, pretty much. The whole country speaks a language called Chinya Rwanda, a Bantu language. Um, and it's, it's a fairly poor economy, but it's improving. Um, it's had 5% growth in recent years, but that's with a lot of donor help, uh, much of which has come from DFID in the UK. There's reasonable health and food security in Rwanda. Um, of course, it's famous for the genocide of 1994. I'm not going to go into that today. Uh, just to say that it's a very safe country now. It's one of the safest countries in Africa for foreigners to visit and internally as well, as is its capital city, Kigali. Um, and the Rwandans are lovely people. They're kind, they're welcoming, they're friendly, like pretty much every, every population that I've lived and worked with in Africa. So um, let's just visit the capital city very quickly. It's called Kigali, or Chigali, as it would be called by Rwandans. Um, it's a very safe city. It's tidy. Um, it's central to the country, and it's got very good transport links, both an airport, which is very central to the town. Um, it's the newest member of the British Commonwealth, and it's recently switched from Francophone as second language to English as second language. Um, and that was one of the reasons that I traveled there. Um, so there's a little bit about the capital. Now let's look at the biogeography of Rwanda, the four habitat types. Um, I've mapped them out here on the, the same map, and you should be able to see there um, the green on the left hand is the Albertine Rift, the highland forest of Rwanda, which historically would have covered the majority of the area shown there. Cultivated farmland covers the majority of the country. Um, the papyrus swamp I've mapped out in yellow there. And there's also quite a lot of savanna and open woodland, a little bit in the south in an area called Bujisera, but the vast majority in the far east um, covering the area called Akajera National Park. Um, so let's... Um, Oh, yes, uh, just to mention the, the, the point that Keith mentioned, it is actually the most, highly dent most densely populated country in Africa. It also has uh, the most densely populated in terms of bird species. Rwanda has, depending on your taxonomy, bet between 695 and 700 species in a country which is indeed the size of whales. Um, <laughs> So, always the size of whales, isn't it? Um, so, let's look at the three locations of, uh, within the Albertine Rift. Uh, get, we're going to look quickly at one at the north. If you just look at the top there, we'll just zoom in on it. This tiny little strip up here called the Volcanoes National Park on the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda is actually the place which is very famous for one animal, which you know. Here are two of the mountains on that forest. Uh, Muhabori, you can see on the, on the right there. Uh, famous for these guys, of course, the mountain gorillas. Um, in Rwanda, you can see them very, very easily. Um, there's several groups of gorillas which are habituated to people. I took these photos myself or point-and-shoot camera because they really do come up extremely close to you. If you want to, if you want to visit the, mount, um, the mountain gorillas, this is the best place to see them, without a doubt. Um, the presence of gorillas in this park, though, means that it's quite difficult to bird. A lot of the Albertine Rift endemics are here, but interestingly, because you're paying 500, it may even be $1,000 to see the gorillas, um, they don't actually like taking birders in in case birders get to see the gorillas without paying for them. Um, this is the nature of the Rwandan National Parks Authority. Um, 
<laughs> so there we go. I'll come on to the birds when we get to the best tractor for us. Let's have a quick look at one tiny little tract left just here. I've sketched it in. It's called Gishwati. And Gishwati did cover a much larger area um, previously, say 50, 100 years ago. Um, but it's, it's pretty much a very small tract of forest now. You can see there I visited it. It's very difficult to get to. I don't recommend visiting it. But it gives you an idea of how the forest is being cut down in Rwanda. Um, there's a tr tiny isolated population of chimpanzees here that there's a very ambitious project to try and relocate them with a corridor, uh, to, to link the corridor to other populations. But it's a long way away. Um, it is now protected, but the presence of a lot of charcoal kilns around. You can see this one here with eucalypt leaves stuffed on the top. I think there may be a lot of selective deforestation. It's right next to the forest, and there didn't seem to be enough eucalypts around to justify the number of charcoal kilns. But anyway, it's theoretically protected, and it may, they may even be trying to increase the size of it and to link it to other Albertine Rift forest. Let's look at the main tract. It's right down there in the southwest, called Nyungwe National Park. Um, Nyungwe National Park is... Uh, almost 1,000 square kilometers of Albertine Rift Forest. It's contiguous with Kibera in North Burundi, and it's in good condition. It's very beautiful. And it's very easy to bird because it's a montane forest, so quite undulating landscape, meaning you're not always looking up at the birds. Um, it's got a fairly low canopy, so you can, uh, and it's not too hot because it's in the mountains, so it's really easy and really enjoyable to go birding there. Uh, the paths are generally fine. There's a fantastic road which you can bird along through the forest, um, and the paths are very extensive. Interestingly, the true source of the Nile is here, despite what Jeremy Clarkson tried to attempt to prove in some idiotic trip into Tanzania. Um, in 2006, they added 107 kilometers to the river. Previously, it was presumed to be in, in Burundi, but in fact, this is the true source of the Nile. And you can trek here. They've recently opened a two-day trek. Some of the birding guides actually do it, and it's a fantastic trek on which to see the, a lot of the endemic species as well. Um, there's also a lot of other incredible wildlife there. Um, to give you an idea, um, Nyungwe Rainforest has 13 primate species, which is 25% of all of Africa's primates can be seen in this one forest, including, uh, including chimpanzees, of course, which are not as habituated as the gorillas. So if you want to see them, you're going to have to trek quite a lot. We had to get up at 3 a.m. to get to these guys at 6 a.m. just before they set off. Feeding in a fig tree won't catch them once they've started moving. Um, so let's get on to the birds. Um, this is the most sought-after species for any birders, any listers visiting Rwanda, the red-collared mountain babbler. Um, it's one of about 36 endemic species in the Albertine Rift uh, forest, of which about 25 are possible in Nyungwe, making it probably the most productive for seeing the Albertine Rift endemics, along with a forest in Uganda called Bwindi. Um, Thanks to John Caddick for this wonderful image, which was taken on the ABC trip to Rwanda in 2011 with Birding Africa, led by Callan Cohen. This bird can only be found in Nyungwe and in one other forest in the DRC called Itwombe, and it's currently unsafe to visit there, so as such, it's, it's a Rwandan endemic of sorts, although there are no endemic species to Rwanda, at least geographically. Here's another one. Uh, we, saw, we saw very briefly Prince Ruspoli's Turaco a moment ago. Turcos are, without doubt, my favorite group of birds. If you don't know about them, they're endemic to Africa. They're incredible birds. Uh, the taxonomists hate them. They don't know where on earth to put them. Um, they're moving about all the time. Every time you see a new table, they're putting them in a different place. And they're absolutely fascinating. Um, they're, they're unique. They're, they're semi-zygodactylous toes. They've, they're also unique in terms of their pigmentation. Anybody studying that will be fascinated to know that the red color in the wings is a completely... Uh, a unique uh, pigment to turacos. It's called turakin. And the green body plumage is also unique to turacos. It's called turacoverdin. Fascinatingly, all other green uh, plumage in birds is caused by, and I've just got it written down here, light diffraction of carotenoids, apparently. And this is the only truly green pigmentation in birds. Um, the Ruinzori turaco may be basal to all the turacos, uh, and it's got this fascinating call, which... If I can get, just get the mouse on there, which distorted my sound recorder when I tried to record it. And that makes you jump when you hear that in the forest behind you. 
Beautiful bird, um, one of my favorites. I'll show you some of the other Turicos of Rwanda a bit later, but they're beautiful birds. Um, they're also quite big, and they bound along the tree trunks, the branches of the trees in African forests. Here's another bird with an incredible call, also endemic. The, the, all the birds I'll be showing you pretty much are endemic to the Albertine Rift at this stage. Archer's ground robin, previously called robin chat. Um, it's got a fascinating call. When you're actually in the forest trying to see it, you locate the call and you, you try to stare at it, and then the bird guide very politely pushes your binoculars to the side because it throws its voice. And then you actually only see it when one of the guides point it out to you. Its, it's call is fascinating. This is an individual singing, and it sounds like two birds. That's just one bird. Presumably using both its syrinxes at the same time, but I'm not sure how it does it. Um, yes. There are lots of apalises in um, Nyungwe rainforest. Um, three of them are endemic. Uh, we've got the Ruwenzori apalis, the Mount Amasta apalis, and the, Ches and the Kungwe apalis. I couldn't get an image of Kungwe apalis. This is one of Nick Barrow's buff-throated apalis Im images because it's one of those birds high up in the treetops. Nobody's got a good photo of it, apparently. And the chestnut-throated. They're beautiful little warblers apalises. Um, another bird, very interestingly, recently found in Nyungwe Forest. It's one of the most recently described species of bird from Africa. Uh, described in 2010, Willard Sooty Bubu. Um, it's, this is the first and only known image of a live Willard Sooty Bubu in the field, taken by Nick Borrow. Thanks again to Nick. Um, it was described from the Ugandan Rift from Bwindi and found in Nyungwe last year by Brian Finch who went with Narcissus and Dayan Baiju, one, one of the best guides there. Um, it's very, very similar to a species called Mountain City Bubu, from which it's only distinguished by eye color, and so the birds were overlooked in museum specimens because of this. Um, segregated altitudinally from um, Mountain City Bubu at slightly lower altitudes, um, and we suspected it would be in Nyungwe, and indeed Narcissus and Brian found it there. So that's a new species, which we can see in Nyungwe as well as in Bwindi. Um, it's got, um, I'm just going to zoom through some of the other um, Albertine Rift endemics in Nyungwe. We've got the strange weaver, which is a beautiful bird. Uh, two fantastically beautiful crimson wings, if you've ever seen these birds. This crimson wing on the left there, quite low population densities, very difficult to see, but beautiful. And John Caddick's image of a uh, dusky crimson wing, much easier to see, and it's a, they're beautiful, stunning birds of crimson wings if you ever get to see them. Um, there are lots of sunbirds in Nyungwe National Park. Excuse me. At least five of which are Albertine Rift endemics. These include the Ruwenzori double-collared sunbird, sometimes called Stulman's double-collared, the blue-headed sunbird, uh, the purple-breasted sunbird, which I'll show you in a moment, um, and the elusive Rockefeller sunbird, very rarely seen, and this little gem, which is called Regal Sunbird, a fantastic picture by Adam Riley. It was on one of the ABC bulletins a while ago, and they're absolutely stunning, the males in breeding plumage, one of the most beautiful birds I've ever seen in my life. Here's another one of the Albertine Rift endemic sunbirds, a purple-breasted sunbird, much more difficult to photograph. Um, they have a very interesting near-symbiotic relationship with a tree called uh, Symphonia. If you find the tree, and you, you'll find the bird. But in Rwanda, where a, a common theme of, of birds in Rwanda is that they often live alongside people quite well. And interestingly, the increase of eucalyptus in Rwanda is, of course, having some negative <coughs> effects. But you also see a lot of birds starting to move into eucalypt forest. And this is one of them, because Narcissus and Dianbaje has often seen it when Symphonia isn't flowering. He's actually seen it in the eucalypt forests, appearing to be possibly on the insects. Some birds often feed on insects as well as nectar, possibly on whatever is the nectar of the eucalypts. I'm, I don't know enough about it. It's an absolute stunner. It's got incredible iridescence. You look at it from one angle, it's black, and then another angle, it just starts glowing in blues and purples. Absolutely beautiful bird. Um, Nyungwe National Forest is improving facilities as well. Um, there's uh, a new luxury hotel, a really good visitor center along the main road, a campsite, quite cold, take a, take a warm sleeping bag if you go there, because we're at about 2,500 meters here. Um, and it's got this incredible new canopy walkway. I, I met the guys who are putting it up. Um, this suspension bridge spanning the valley is an amazing place to go and have a look. 
just over, you can see right down to the Lake Kivu and the Democratic Republic of Congo from there. Um, the actual guides themselves won't go on it. They're terrified of this, but they will go <laughs> on the canopy walkway. And you can't blame them because it's one of those ones. It's just literally a foot wide. Anyway, it's a really, there's really good facilities improving there as well. So um, let's meet some of the guides here. This is, uh, you can just see on the, on the right there, uh, Narcisse and Dayambaji and Clava and Toinkima. These are the two best bird guides in Yungwe. They're absolutely stunning with their ears, as all forest guides have to be. And they've set up this amazing little bird watching club for the local kids, which I wanted just to promote. So if you go on Facebook, you'll find it. It's called Nyungwe Kids Bird Watching Club. And on their own, Narcisse and Clava have started this up. They're running it for very obvious reasons of involving the local community in the conservation and valuing of the rainforest and also in training up some of these kids to be guides. It's definitely the coolest uh, bird watching club in Africa, at least that I know of. Um, and if you want to donate old binoculars or any books, Birds of East Africa, if you've got an old copy of that or any other book that might help, please uh, pass them on to me and I'll make sure that they get to Narcissus. It's a very, very sustainable project. They thought of it, they started it up, and they're running it. So please do donate any binoculars if you've got them. I'll, I'll mention that again at the end. Um, let's move on to the second habitat type, uh, Savannah Woodland, Akajera National Park. You can see it in the um, east of the country there. And you can see this, the map itself is actually quite old. The, the previous park is the, the old, larger area. And I've kind of scribbled in a, a green line to show you where the current park is approximately. Um, after the genocide in about 1994, 1995, they degazetted a large part of the park to um, accommodate returning refugees after the genocide. And the current national park is a little bit smaller. It's not very well known, um, Akajera, but it should be. Um, it's, yes, I'll just mention now. It's, it used to boast 527 species, which, to put that in perspective, is the second largest, I believe, of any park in Africa after Queen Victoria in Uganda. That makes it more than, say, in the Serengeti or even in the Kruger National Park in South Africa. So it's a very, very good park. Now, with the new park, it's probably down to 482 species, but we suspect we'll increase that back up to at least 500 once you know, all the species have been recorded. Let's listen to a little bit of the park. So you can see there it's completely different from the Albertine Rift. You can hear these birds. We've got bearded woodpecker, the second largest woodpecker in Africa, drumming there, slate-colored boo-boo, and trilling cysticola are just three of the typical sounds that characterize this wonderful park. And you can see there, that's Tanzania just across the border on the other side of those lakes, papyrus swamps on the lakes there. It's completely different from the Albertine Rift. It's the lowest part of Rwanda, and to give you an idea of how high the actual the general center of Africa is. We're at 1,350 meters here, about the height of the top of Ben Nevis, and it's still the lowest part in the country. Much lower rainforest, so it's characterized by open areas of grassland, acacia, comifera, combretum, savanna, and there's some brachystegia or miombo woodland on sandier soils. Akajera is a typical set of safari animals. The Maasai giraffe was actually imported there, uh, it was never known to be this side of the Akajera River. It was over on the other side, on the Lake Victoria side. Um, but they imported them there. There's tons of acacia, so they're doing very, very well there. Um, there's eland, giraffe, topi, zebra. So you can see all of these species. There's leopard, and there's rumored to be one lion. Um, I don't think that's a viable population. But they are planning to get more in there. So... Um, there's also lots of uh, buffalo as well, and everywhere you look in Akajera National Park, there's birds. You can see cattle egrets here and um, yellow bulldog pecker on the top of this guy. And just look at this photo. Um, if you can spot the species there, you might recognize some of them. Glossy ibis, intermediate egret, cattle egret, long-toed lapwing, African jacana, red billed oxpeckers in this one, and a winding cysticle. You can't see him, but I promise he was in the bushes there. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely picture, though. Um, cool. So in terms of target species, Akajera doesn't necessarily have that many. There's a few Victoria Basin endemics. This is the best one, the red-faced barbet, very similar to other um, barbet species. 
but um, it's found pretty much Akajira National Park is in the center of its range, so it's a very good place to see it. This photo is actually taken from Uganda, I have to say, from Lake Mburu National Park, again by Nick Burra, thanks to him. Um, but it's, it's found in, in Akajira National Park, a nice bird to see. Akajira also has a little bit of Myombo woodland, so you see some of the more southerly African birds, like Suja's shrike there, which tends to be a Myombo specialist, but you can find it um, in Akajira. Um, the long-tailed cysticola, also called a cysticola, after the town in western Tanzania. And that's one of 11 cysticola species that can be found in the park. I'm just going to zoom through a few of my favorite birds from the park. Um, here is uh, the white-winged tit, white-winged black tit. Um, eight species of kingfisher in the park, including the gray-headed kingfisher, a dryland species, a dry, dry country kingfisher. Um, here is a wonderful weaver. There are 12 weaver species in Akajera National Park. Um, this is the red-headed weaver. He varies a lot across Africa. You may have seen a different subspecies in other parts of Africa. Um, this, I love this photo. He's, he's right, to start, right at the beginning of nest construction here, and he looks like he's having an Ikea moment. Um, where, where are those instructions? And unlike other weavers, which build these beautifully characteristic nests, by the time the red-headed weaver is finished, it looks like me after putting together an Ikea wardrobe. It's just a big mess, basically. Um, Anyway, it's a lovely photo, that one, I thought. Um, swallow species. There are 12 swallow, swallow species in Akajira National Park. Lesser striped swallow is one of them. Um, just to mention that all my photos, if they haven't got other people's credits, proper photographers, they're taken on a point-and-shoot camera with a 10 times zoom. The birds in Rwanda are very tame. They're not persecuted as much as they are in other parts of Africa. Um, and these guys let me get two kilometers away. So you can even get good photos on a standard camera of the birds there. This is a fascinating picture. Um, it's kind of Africa's equivalent of the little owl, the pearl-spotted owl. Any African birder will, will know this bird very well. If you've got the call, you can play it back, and it will bring in huge numbers of smaller birds to mob it. Um, but what's fascinating about this image is the size of the animal it's got there. I'd love to know from any mammalian zoologist what it might be. But it, if you think about that, I presume it's a rodent, it's probably going to be as heavy as the owl is itself. Uh, and it's fascinating that it just carried it onto that tree trunk. And I took a quick photo and backed off to ensure that it didn't lose its prey or fly off about its prey. But an amazing image there. Uh, this one should be familiar to UK birders, wood sand. Uh, very common during the Palearctic winter, along with several other migrant waders. And there's also significant movements of migrating raptors uh, uh, through Akajera <coughs> National Park because there are, there are hill kind of chains which run north-south. So very good for in the spring and the autumn for species such as lesser spotted eagle, European hobby, Wahlberg's eagle, and intra-African migrants. And the future of Akajera is looking good. Um, it's just been taken over quite recently by African parks. They've nearly completed the fence of the park, which is good for what's inside the park, reduces poaching, means that they're going to reintroduce rhino uh, and lion at the same time. And the fence should reduce the poaching threat, but of course it will mean that any habitat outside the park, and there is some, some good habitat there, will actually probably disappear. Let's move on to the next habitat type. Papyrus swamps. I tend to call it papyrus, but apparently it's pronounced papyrus. So um, you can see it here highlighted in yellow. Um, it generally falls along the Kajera River, which this is the, the source of the, the, the actual Nile actually runs along the Kajera River. Uh, from just south of Kigali, it becomes a little bit flatter, and you get lots of papyrus swamp along there. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting, a very beautiful habitat. I lived in the town of Chibungo. You can see it right in the center of the area there. So I spent a lot of time um, looking at the birds, enjoying the birds here in this park. Um, here's a bit of, of the park, of the, the, the papyrus swamp. You can hear, I, th I think it's African reed wobbler there. Sounds very much like ours. Uh, papyrus gone like in the background and winding cysticola are also there. Um, and I'll come on to some of those birds in a moment. You can see that the papyrus swamp is in the valley there between uh, what are quite extensively cultivated hillsides, and it's a habitat that remains pretty, pretty pristine because people can't get into there to do much other than a little bit of fishing. Uh, you can even get Sitatunga antelope still in these areas and a species of monkey, of gen a subspecies of gentle monkey. I'm not sure if it's blue or silver. Um, but but you, can, you, you can find mammals there as well. Let's look at some of the birds. Of course, the, one of the most famous birds of the papyrus swamps is the, is the incredible Shubal, recently shown on a BBC uh, wildlife um, documentary. 
the first evidence of siblicide came from, came from that documentary, I believe. It's absolutely gigantic. If you get time to see the shoe bill, there's a shoe bill just in the bird area of the museum. When you see how big they are, you suddenly realize why this bird is one of the most sought after birds in Africa. But it's declining massively. Neil Baker thinks it's pretty much on its way out in Tanzania, and they've got much larger swamps. Uganda and, Tan and, Z and Zambia are possibly the two places where it's still clinging on fairly well. In Rwanda, there may only be two or three breeding pairs, but the sites are reliable for them. So you should see them, but at a distance. Um, his, this is a beautiful Bradipterus warbler which you find in the papyrus swamp. Very difficult to photograph. I'm very proud of this photograph. I was up to my knees in water, le uh, leeches trying to photograph it. But the white-winged swamp warbler, it's one of, the, one of the very specific papyrus endemics in the Victoria Basin area. Another one, Corova cysticula, also found outside papyrus. Um, not a very interesting bird. It's one of your LBJs, but it's a, it's a nice papyrus endemic pretty much. Um, then two really rare papyrus um, endemics, the papyrus canary, which is really difficult to find in photograph, very low density, and the papyrus yellow warbler. This image which I took is probably an immature juvenile bird, um, but it's also found there. I only, I only saw this bird on a couple of occasions when I was in Rwanda, but it is there, and it's a target species for anybody looking for the Victoria Basin endemics. Um, and then my favorite, the wonderful papyrus gonalec. If you don't know gonalecs there, you can see the, the family, the genus there. They're related to shrikes, um, and they're beautiful birds. They're beautiful both in their appearance and in their call. This guy is completely endemic to papyrus swamps, um, and its call is fantastic. Just watch and listen to this video. You'll hear it call at the start. All gonalecs, like boo-boos, they, they sing it, they call in duets, so the male calls, and the female often responds. You'll hear the majority of the call is the male, and then you'll hear the female at the end. Oh, I know, I have to press play, don't I? Let me do it, let me do it. Yes, there we go. That's it. It sounds like something out of Star Wars when you hear it. So it's a beautiful call to see in the papyrus swamps, and it's a real treat of a bird to find. Um, you do have to be patient to find it. Getting up at 5 a.m. is probably the best job, um, but it's one of, the, one of the beautiful birds of the papyrus swamp. Let's move on to the last habitat in my talk, agricultural land. Uh, I'm going to move through this quite quickly. The majority of Rwanda is covered with agricultural land, and you'll find... Um, a lot of it around Kigali, the capital city. I was down here in Chibungo, as I said, where there was lots of good agricultural land. Um, I was saying earlier that um, it's a very productive habitat for birding. In a day, you can walk around and see 100 species, no problems. Um, and it's because Rwanda has been farmed for millennia, the birds and the people live alongside each other quite well. This is a typical mosaic of agricultural land. You can see the rice um, paddies in the bottom of the valley. You can see the hillside, the banana trees on the lower hillside with fig trees in amongst them. The upper hillsides have little bits of grazing land and scrub along with introduced exotics such as eucalypt and fir trees. Um, and despite this fairly intensive farming method, the birds do really, really well alongside people. Um, you can see here, this is a place called Gassiza. Rwanda is called the land of a thousand hills by the Rwandan Tourist Board, and it is incredibly, stunningly beautiful. Um, you can also see these incredible animals, the Ancole cattle, um, the largest horns proportional to body size of any animal, I'm told. Um, some of these individuals, the span between the horns is wider than the length of the cow, up to two meters. There's tea plantations as well in Rwanda. The, a really good place to see Sifling cysticula, interestingly, of all birds. They seem to have got used to them. Yorkshire tea now source a lot of their tea in this part of Rwanda. This is near Nyungwe rainforest. It's really good tea, believe me. Um, and then, of course, another part of the agricultural land is the Lake, Lake Kivu. It's like, it's almost very deep. It's like a Norwegian fjord in the center of Africa uh, on the border of the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's a stunning place to visit as well. If you go birding in agricultural areas, expect a few kids to come along and watch birds with you. This is Marcel Klaassen, the former ABC uh, representative for Rwanda, showing the kids a few birds. After initially trying to shoo them off, I suddenly realized that they've had much better eyesight than me. So once they knew what I was looking for, they would often point out a lot of birds, find a lot of new species for me. And they really got into it, some of the local kids. I would take them with me quite regularly. Let's have a look at some of the birds of the, of the agricultural land really quickly. Moustache grass warbler, previously called African moustache warbler, 
possibly the largest warbler in Africa if, and one of the largest in the world, beautiful bird. Uh, another stunning gonalek. This is the black-headed gonalek, which you'll find on the uh, agricultural areas. Um, weavers, there's 10 species of weavers on agricultural land found in Rwanda. The black-headed here. Uh, bishops, you've got the black-winged bishop, the male in breeding plumage is one of those incredibly stunning birds. Um, incredible plumage as any bird in the world, I think. Bee-eaters, there's um, eight species found in Rwanda. This is the cinnamon-chested bee-eater found across the country. You can see these guys in eucalypt. They, they do very well on eucalypt forest. Lots of insects seem to buzz around the eucalypts, and the cinnamon-chested has, has colonized that woodland quite well. Uh, night jars, there's nine species of night jars in Rwanda. Like much of Africa, it's really, really difficult to ID them. The fiery neck night jar used to be lumped with the black shouldered night jar, Nigris scapularis, um, and recently controversially separated. I think Fry was the first person who did that. And since the separation, neither species had been confirmed in Rwanda separately. So this was actually the first confirmed image. Nigel Clear helped with the ID of this, uh, of fiery neck night jar in Rwanda. And I also got black shouldered night jar there as well. Um, possibly overlapping, but I, I kind of agree with a lot of the evidence that they probably should be lumped at the moment um, as, as species after having written a short paper for them for the ABC Bulletin. Um, woodpeckers, this is a really beautiful image of greenback woodpeckers. This is a, uh, a beehive, a pair, male and female, feeding on a beehive in an acacia tree, uh, quite happy to feed on the wood of the hive as well as the tree. Again, everywhere you see, you see birds living alongside people. Um, Long-crested eagle, one of the few raptors that does quite well alongside people in Africa. Um, really, really beautiful bird, incredibly stunning, really easy to photograph as well. Uh, Malachite kingfisher, this little guy spent most of his day perched on the edge of a fisherman's dugout canoe where he's sitting now. Uh, and he was incredibly tame. Any fish that fell into the bottom of the boat, he'd take them. He'd got used to the farmer, so to, to the fisherman. So Marcel Klaassen and I got very, very close to it. I've got a wonderful photo of Marcel with his telephoto zoom that's actually longer than the distance between the end of the zoom and the bird. And so he's got this photo of just its eye. It's an incredible, amazing picture. Um, Again, the birds there in Rwanda are really easy to see. Um, here you can see a heronry of the black-headed heron. There are at least 50 nests in this massive old fig tree. The old figs are often left on the agricultural land. They're too big to cut down and cut up unless you've got the right machinery. And they can, it's considered lucky and, um, and quite good to have one on your land. So they tend to be left. Um, you also get lots of large water birds nesting in village. This is a colony in silky oak hanging over... Uh, the main east-west road in Rwanda, uh, pinkback pelican alongside yellow bull stork, both in the same set of trees, beautiful birds, but you can imagine the mess on the road beneath them. Uh, be careful when you're looking up to photograph them. Um, then two interesting birds of the agricultural land. The white-collared olive back is in uh, Victoria Basin endemic. It's got low population density. I got lots of good photos of it, actually. There aren't many good photos of this bird because it's quite rare. And its call, possibly never documented. I consulted Brian Finch about this call. Um, note that if you read the guides, it's actually, it's actually described quite a plain call. But listen to this. Not that. Not the, it's not the kind of call that you'd associate with an olive back normally, but that was the white colored olive back calling, and uh, um, uh, it's possibly a new call for the species. It's not in the literature. Um, and then, of course, another bird which is uh, found in Rwanda. The Ruaha chat was recently described uh, from um, Ruaha National Park. Sue Stolberger and Robert Glenn, they noticed it. She was drawing, she's an illustrator, she's Sue Stolberger, and she was drawing pictures of birds. She noticed that the birds that were slightly different from the black chats found further south in Africa. In Ruaha National Park, they're pretty much endemic to Myombo woodland. In Rwanda, they're not. They're only found alongside people, and they're replaced in the woodland by sooty chat. So there's a fascinating role reversal. I was working in a lot of the schools. This is a female from a local primary school I was visiting. And almost every school in eastern Rwanda has a resident pair of Ruaha chats. Uh, I would often be in a lesson, in a classroom observing a lesson and a breeding uh, pair of Ruaha chats at the same time. It meant that the feedback on the lesson wasn't always as good as it should have been. But it's a fascinating bird. And this is, again, another example of birds and people living alongside each other in Rwanda and doing quite well. Um, let's zoom on to a couple more of the beautiful Turicos of Rwanda. 
Here you can see those same pigments again on this purple crested turaco, quite common across much of southern Africa. And the ridiculously colored Ross's turaco. It looks like a big Disney animation kind of bounding through the trees when you see it, Ross's turaco. And it's a wonderful bird to see the first time you see it. A few more sunbirds, bronzy sunbird, one of the larger sunbirds in Africa. A really nice photo of a male and a female pair here. The flowers almost seem to be made for those bills. Um, the, the stunning scarlet-chested sunbird, again, very common all over much of Africa, uh, the male there. And the variable sunbird, as its name suggests, it varies a lot in different parts of Africa. On to the logistics of the country, um, transport, accommodation, and guides. Well, uh, Rwanda has got a very, very good, by far the best in East Africa, road infrastructure. It's a small country, so the investment comparatively isn't that great to actually create good roads in the country. It links the, all the parks to the capital cities within just a few hours. The roads aren't congested, even in Kigali. There's high quality, if expensive, accommodation found at all key locations, Nyungwe, Akajera, Volcans for the gorillas. Um, and there's cheaper accommodation available, a wonderful little guest house in Nyungwe called, um, I've forgotten its name. Um, and then I've got um, printouts of this page, by the way. If anybody's interested in going, just come and see me. I've got printouts. The new ABC Barrett for Rwanda, um, just recently appointed, Claudian Nsaba Gasani is also a tour guide and he can organize all logistics for you in the country. He's a really good birder. He's a serious ornithologist as well. Done a lot of work on grower swamp warbler. His website is rwandabirding.com. Um, excuse me, just to publicize two tours coming up. Birding Africa, um, who did the ABC Conservation Fund tour to Rwanda in 2011. Many of John Caddick's images, I think, came from that tour. Um, and they will return in August this year as part of a larger Rwanda-Uganda tour. Serious hardcore. You're going to get a lot of birds if you go on that trip from July to August 2013, which will include gorillas and chimps as well. Birding Africa, you know there. It'll probably be Callan Cohen leading. I'm not sure, though. Rock Jumper also are planning a tour a bit later if you can't make it this summer. Uh, to include gorillas as well. If you're visiting Nyungwe, make sure you email or call ahead to request Clava and Toyinkima or Narcis and Dayambadje, who are definitely the two bird guides to go with. Rwanda Tourism also offer packages. I'd like to publicize them, but they can be very pricey, and the price structure is very idiosyncratic in the national parks. Interestingly, if you go bird watching, it costs you more than if you go nature watching. Um, you, you pay a different fee. And then when you start looking at the birds, they tell you not to look at the birds because you haven't paid for it. But anyway, they're, they're trying their best to work out a system, um, and we're trying to help with that. So um, just a little bit about when to visit. There is no perfect time to visit. Any All year round, it's good. The wettest months are March to May and September to November. The disadvantage, you've got the mud on the tracks, rain obviously happening at the same time, some impassable roads but also breeding activity peaks during the wettest time of the year. Driest is July to August, and migration is evident in the spring and the autumn, as you'd expect. Um, if I had to choose, I'd probably go for April to June if I, uh, if I was visiting just for a short trip, because you're just at the end of the breeding season, so there is plenty of breeding activity, and often you'll get better weather at that time as well. Uh, last of all, a few little books to recommend. Uh, one of the Helm Field Guides, of course, um, Birds of East Africa. Nigel, I understand that the, um, there's, an, there's a, um, an app now available for iPhones and also for, um, is it for all smartphones, which you can give now for the calls, um, which is Brian Finch's Life's Work on the Birds of East Africa, um, if you're interested in that. And you, uh, a souvenir book, Birds in Rwanda, an atlas and handbook by... Jean-Pierre Van der Vey and his son Gail Van der Vey, published by the Rwandan RDB. It's a beautiful book. I've got it. I'm happy to say I contributed a lot of photos to it, and it's a great book to take. And if you're interested in the gorillas, of course, everybody knows about Diane Fossey. Um, but I would also recommend this book as well, Bill Weber and Amy Vedder's book, In the Kingdom of, the Gor of Gorillas. They were the people who actually created... Uh, Diane Fossey brought, brought gorillas to fame, but they actually created the first sustainable ecotourism project in relation to gorillas. And it's a really, really beautiful book to read as well. It's fascinating. Um, um, but just to mention very, very quickly, as it's coming through, um, if you do have any binoculars to donate or any books which you think might be of use, please bring them to me and I'll make sure that they'll get to Nyungwe Kids Bird Watching Club. And feel free to visit and like them on Facebook. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.